Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Emmis. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part of two for the 4th of August 2023, holiday day. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, let's go to where we usually start, which is the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, of course. Uh, 640 KIA for the Russians yesterday. That's where we've seen it for the last couple of days. A slight uptick from the 400s and 500s seen previously. Four tanks, 15 APVs, armored personnel vehicles, so infantry fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers, mine resistant ambush protection vehicles. 15 of them is quite a big loss for the Russians, of course. 19 artillery systems, another bad day around the 20 mark. Uh, just goes to show that uh, the, the Ukrainians are still really serious about this attritional phase and about taking out particularly Russian artillery systems so that they can do larger scale attacks. One anti-aircraft warfare system. I'm going to show you a couple of books that have been taken out. Uh, they, uh, yes, they, they, the Russians lost two. Uh, so, you know, they are losing consistently. And in fact, uh, I'll show you one. It's 36 miles behind the front line, which is, uh, again, I think a significant uh, indication. 27 drones. That's not from last night and night before. 20 vehicles and fuel tanks. That is another high number there for for that category and I think the Russians must really be struggling uh, in terms of logistics um, there was a claim yesterday that they're afraid to go outside in the daytime type thing but that's a pro pro Ukrainian source probably saying that rhetorically but I think it must be an element of like so like every one of these hits is is someone that other people know Okay, so if it's artillery, you know that loads of your other artillery crew members from other units or from your kind of battery or brigade or whatever, you will know that, that friends have been hit, that, that colleagues have been taken out. And you th you'd be thinking, uh, am I going to be next? Is today the day? There's the same with trucks and logistics. You know you're getting desperate for trucks. You're using Bacankas, you're using commercial trucks. Uh, you're driving them thinking is today the day you know there must be this sense with the russian troops that i think we shouldn't underestimate this uh psychological effect of just large-scale destruction of russian equipment of course that that cuts both ways i'm sure the russians are hitting the ukrainians but are they doing it to the same extent uh evidence tends to to suggest otherwise Three pieces of special equipment, so that's going to be intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, uh, probably electronic warfare, that kind of stuff. Okay, let's see what Oryx has to say about equipment loss. So the Ukrainians have lost 27 pieces of equipment, or at least that's what they've totted up yesterday. I've mentioned before that you can't be certain with Oryx they are or any of these kind of aggregators because the information can come in and it might be pieces of kit from a year ago and that's the same for both sides of course but just you know bear that in mind uh so there are a, a number of tanks again older tanks not not the western provided uh vehicles so that is significant uh a bradley there that might be an older one i don't know i've seen any on the front lines recently i don't know if they've they pulled them back uh maybe as a kind of pr Thing, you know, throw in the old, make sure you use the older stuff. We don't want to to show to our Western allies that we're losing the kit they're providing us. That's the Mi-8 transport helicopter that I think Andrew Perpetua had uh, down yesterday. So that was, um, that's now on the Oryx list. And for the Russians, we have uh, a slightly more. So 27 for the Ukrainians, 48 for the Russians. Uh, that includes quite a few BMPs, a lot of... Uh, a lot of infantry fighting vehicles essentially is what's making up that and then probably double the double the amount of tanks as well uh so t80s t72s t64s uh andrew uh well before we get on to andrew perpetuous so this is oryx's reliability is only two percent of uh duplicates this is very low so this is referring to archie irving who goes who's one of the people who goes through and looks, with, you know, with fine tooth comb, goes through the Oryx data and looks for duplicates. And Oryx has thanked them. It's not like you're trying to show me up here or show us up here, but actually thank you for doing that. Now, Archie Irving has, has gone through all the duplicates and, and put them into, um, you know, data presentation. Someone else or Dead District here saying that 2% of duplicates, but I actually replied to that saying, it's actually better than that because it's really important to understand that 
once you've gone through all those duplicates, so when you look at Oryx now, aside from any kind of new data that's coming in today or yesterday or whatever, but if you look at all their data now, those 2% have been sorted. So now the data should be near a 0%. So actually, you need to understand that, I think, to, to, to know that when you look at the data, new data coming in might be 2% duplicates, but the data there now, it's been gone through plenty of times. You might find the odd one still in existence, right? But essentially, that's going to be near at 0% duplicates because the duplicates have already been found. Right. And that, that's so important. That goes to uh, understanding how uh, reliable Oryx data is. Now, the, it's not to say there aren't skews, that the data isn't skewed to certain types of categories, to certain maybe Ukrainians over the Russians or Russians over the Ukrainian, or that can change depending on what the category is. It might be that you see more Russian tanks on, a, uh, on the list than Ukrainian tanks because of some data skew, and you might see more... Uh, you, Ukrainian, I don't know, air defense systems and Russian air defense systems, or the other way around, or whatever, you get the point. Uh, anyway, Andrew Perpetua has gone through, again, he, the videos that he's seen and, and images he's seen over the last 24 hours, and this is what he's come up with, which, which again, is broadly in line with Oryx, about a two, well, approaching a two, well, it is certainly a two to one here, uh, maybe slightly more, actually. Uh, a lot of tanks there. Um, there are quite, quite a few surveillance uh, ISR stuff um, and, uh, yeah, uh, a much larger number of tanks that the Russians have lost compared to the Ukrainians. But, um, yeah, I, I wonder whether someone asked me yesterday whether they think that Andrew Perpetua is going to take over because Oryx is going to uh, ditch it in in October. Uh, he was hoping to get some kind of job out of that. But, but what's happened with Oryx is that Western intelligence sources – it, it, no, Western intelligence organizations, literally national intelligence organizations and Western media all use Oryx. Literally, they use them. So when the British intelligence results, uh, you know, um, updates come out or when the US intelligence says, oh, they've lost this amount of stuff, they are using as, as baseline modeling Oryx data. And Oryx have been like, yeah, doing all this work. No one's paying me. And it's taken up their lives because actually that's not their job. They're they're doing it in their in you know as as a kind of side hustle, and uh, they were hoping to get something out of it. No one's actually gone you know given them a job. Surely, come on, U.S. intelligence. How much money do they spend a year? Surely it's just like, oh yeah. Do you know what? For fifty grand a year, you're doing you're do here. You go like. You're doing work that everyone is relying on. So yeah, I just yeah I don't know everyone's just getting out of oryx i guess what they can um anyway that's a side note amazing dance of a missile that fired off uncontrollably from a russian book sam system this i've just shown you this because there's uh something quite uh i don't know mesmerizing about this this cooking off missile cooking off here having a, a frantic dance in the countryside of uh Ukraine there and it's still going still going still going and then get, indeed goes off camera so there you go uh, that's a book that's a surface to MSL uh, system and uh, another one taken out as well here so that's a couple we saw two on Andrew Perpetua's list one on Oryx's list there so yeah they are aiming for these books and indeed uh is it here no I've no, somewhere else I might have accidentally, accidentally deleted it, but saying it's 36 miles behind the line in the Robotna area. And that is con considerable. You know, you've got to get drones up there by the looks of it, if, it if, the, if that is one of the two that was 36 miles behind. You've got to get drones all, all that distance behind enemy lines. You've got to do all this stuff. And it means that probably the air defense systems in front of that have been taken out. This is about expanding the ability for the Ukrainians to operate both ground maneuvers and possibly in the air. Um, they, they are doing such a good job, attritionally speaking. Okay, the Russians are continuing to hit places like Kherson, Nikopol, Marinets. Um, the, those last two were north of the reservoir, the Zaporizhia reservoir. Uh, Kherson gets hit like this every day by shelling. I don't report it, but just to remind you once in a while, 
that that is that is happening consistently. Left bank and Nipro, some kind of explosion looks eerily beautiful but it's obviously uh, representing uh, horrific destruction in this i don't know what the target was but something russian uh, has been hit on the left bank of the necro there and uh, we have a wave of arson attacks that i told you about yesterday on enlistment officers in russia has claimed a victim here 76 year old valery mikhailovich was has allegedly committed suicide yesterday he tried to set fire to the army office in Verzolov. So many letters together that shouldn't be together. Uh, he was released after questioning only to kill himself. And that's desperately sad. But one wonders whether he did kill himself, really. Uh, and that's the nature of Russia uh, and what we hear about stuff like that. Uh, this fascinates me, right? So on the one hand, they've got the Russians have captured a CB-90, a Swedish top of the range infantry fighting vehicle and they've got this tech back and that's bad news for nato because you know russia are going to get their hands on it look at it and all this kind of stuff but here we have ra novosti showing a you know doing a news segment on shoigu the defense minister and some uh other russian i guess he's looking there was some joke about him looking he's just getting really jealous about uh, a ton of tuna <laughs> or some other joke but anyway the, on the one hand, this is bad for the for the Swedes and NATO. On the other hand, this is just a really, I'd say there's something damning about this because it, these guys are so obsessed with the tech here because they don't have the tech. So after the Cold War has been and supposedly gone, uh, you would think that you, with the the internet these days and um, with technological advancements that they'd be pretty much neck and neck with this kind of kit and lo and behold they have to put on some big song and dance about taking this kit but the implication is because they don't have that kit they don't have the tech themselves so i don't know that to me is almost embarrassing footage yes take it back yes look at it but do it on the quiet don't make a song and dance about it because all it does is shows that you don't have as good a stuff as they do. That's a bit embarrassing. Right, moving on to long distance strikes, and goodness me, there is some news today. Right, Russia launched at least 1,961 Shahid drones against Ukraine since the full-scale war, according to Zelensky. A significant portion of them have been successfully shot down. Unfortunately, not all of them. We are working to have more air defense systems in place. This is uh, one of the big priorities of the Ukrainians, has been for a long time, but they are still concentrating on getting more and more air defense systems in place around Ukraine to give their ne network coverage, uh, you know, to improve it and... Uh, plug the gaps with that coverage right before we get on to the big piece of news in fact yes no we will go into this one uh so i don't know what's been hit here but this is significant there are varying claims just just have a look at this footage it is absolutely incredible right this is in i believe moscow area that is genuine footage as far as I can tell. Wow. And uh, one of the people behind the camera just starts sort of crying. Um, because, see, you know, you think, oh my goodness, war has come to us. Well, yeah, yeah. This is the kind of intention. But I don't know really what's gone on here. So uh, here, someone says that... Um, it was oxygen battery warehouses exploded uh, where batteries for drones were made, right? So that's one claim. Then another claim here is a natural gas power plant. I'm pretty sure that's the same um, smoke coming from there. Yeah, it's that, that really white smoke coming out there. Natural gas power plant has exploded in the Voskronensky district of Moscow region. So that would be absolutely terrible. And then someone else claims it's an oxygen storage warehouse in Moscow has claimed the production of the batteries for the Russian military drones. Either way, there are two things. One, it's going to be damaging for the Russians. Two, it's going to be, this will be not someone smoking around the corner. I'm sure the Ukrainians will have something to do with this. If it's either of those, uh, those places as a target, either a, a natural gas, some, there's someone else is saying a gas station, so either a natural gas 
plant or an oxygen battery warehouse or whatever, it sounds like that will have Russian fingerprints, uh, Ukrainian fingerprints all over it. Tokmak's been hit again. I think this is today. Oh, no, it's from yesterday uh, or somewhere not, not far from it. That's not unusual. Uh, all the usual places I'm pretty sure would have been hit. Right. The biggest bit of news today is this. So this happened last night. Uh, when I reported this, the Tandar says early uh, this early morning about the USV, that's an unmanned sea vehicle, a naval drone attack on Nova Rusis. I was already suspecting that something is different and that uh, here we have the reason why. So the Russian regime first triumphantly claimed that the attack was repelled. But here we have footage of a heavily damaged Rapucha class landing ship, uh, possibly the Olenogorsky Gornyak. She has a heavy list on her port side. This is really significant. So uh, we have another Russian vessel hit. Um, and indeed, this is being reported widely. Russians are reporting that a number of unidentified naval drones attack ports on the Black Sea at night, including the Novorossiysk port, where a large military ship, the Olenegorsky Gonyak, which is being towed in the video, was damaged. Meanwhile, Russian officials declared that all attacks were successfully repelled. Um, yeah, not so much. Uh, this is what the Russians put out. I think one of the videos, so on the other hand, Russian media and a local government claim that naval drones were destroyed. And that is an explosion of something in the water. Well done, Russia. So uh, they have uh, apparently destroyed uh, all the threats. The locals report a series of explosion at Luznyaya Ozerievka near Russia's Black Sea port of Novorossiysk. The Caspian Pipeline Consortium's Mar marine oil terminal is located in that area. According to unconfirmed reports, marine drones attacked and damaged Russia's Black Sea oil beacon. So something is on fire out there in the sea. Don't know exactly what it is. Uh, footage isn't the best quality. And then the latest I I've seen of that naval vessel, it looks in even worse uh, situation now. So that list is heavy and it looks like Part of the bow is underwater there. If you can see, just uh, uh, or very close to being. It just looks like it's it's worse than the other footage, but I can't uh, confirm that for sure. Uh, that footage isn't great, um, but this is significant. And now footage of the actual drone has come out. So a video surfaced of the drone attacking the Russian uh, ship. Here it is and hits the side where it is lurking in the water now, um, obviously rupturing one of the compartments there. Uh, here, uh, apparently a 450 kilogram explosive on board. That is going to be fairly significant. That will hurt. That will hurt the Russian um, pride an awful lot as well. Uh, as ever with these hits, the Russians will hit back and get their retributive um, vengeance. That's the nature of, of their military project here. Russian air defense is active in, so moving on from that, that is really significant, but uh, uh, you know, not too much else to sound out. I'm sure lots of news will come out today. Russian air defense is active in Russian occupied Crimea. An explosion can be seen and locals claim that an oil depot has been hit in Theodosia, which would be 250 kilometers from the Russian front line. That's being reported widely as well. Ukraine attacked Crimea overnight. It was very loud in Theodosia. So Theodosia is here, right, um, well, between Kerch and on the way to Sevastopol, but it's it's quite a long way from Ukrainians. We have previously seen hits around there, uh, so just to the east of there, being done by partisans precisely because they were just sort of out of range of Ukrainian missiles and whatnot. That is 250 kilometres from the front line. So you're talking 300 kilometres from where you'd safely be thinking about dropping something like Storm Shadow. Uh, it depends what the the actual range of Storm Shadows are, but it, it could well be that this is right on the edge of Storm Shadow range or beyond it. So who knows, it might well be drones that have taken that target out rather than a Storm Shadow. Um, so that is, uh, that is Crimea. And the occupational administration of Crimea is hiding an attack on a military base in Fardiska. Uh, Russian media reported that drones were flying to the airfield, but all were shot down, although there is a video confirmation of missile hits. The Russians introduced censorship on news about arrivals against the backdrop of mass flights from Crimea 
uh, after the strike on the Kerch Bridge. So this uh, came, this is out this morning. I don't know that I had heard of hits there yesterday. In fact, I'm pretty sure I reported it. But, you know, the Russians are doing their very best to put a lid on these. It reminds me of what I said yesterday about the floods in Beijing, about the sense of trying not to let the world know about all the flooding that has that's ripped into uh, into China, uh, into areas around Beijing. And they're putting up these hoardings to stop people physically seeing it and taking uh, video footage of it. It's just like, you know, the desperation for control in the narrative. Well, it's the same with the Russians here, of course. You know, that kind of authoritarian regime, that's exactly what you would expect. Right, uh, going on to other bits and pieces, David D here says... Uh, he's got a map of all the Russian units and where they are deployed along the front lines. And you can see this very thick concentration of Russian forces uh, in different locations. But once you get past the Suravikin line, or really up to areas of the Sur Suravikin line, there ain't nothing really. Th this, this is the worry for the Russians. And this is why people like myself are... Like I did, I did. Uh, I talked about this in my extra video yesterday with reference to Arty Green and his interview, a Ukrainian commander. So go and check that out, where he says we are attriting and everything's going to plan basically. And it's a bit like Kherson, where we had two months of attrition before the Russians realised that they couldn't defend anymore and pulled out. Well, this is what's going on. Uh, we are hitting, absolutely hammering logistics. And all the while are treating frontline resources such as air defense systems and artillery. And at some point, the, the Russians will capitulate. They will not be able to do, you know, the, 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 defend, the type of defending they need to do. And that will leave the Ukrainians able to change to a maneuver phase and properly move in to exploit the weaknesses. So... Uh, I thought that was an interesting map. It's not the most technical of maps there, but you get the point. It does give you an indication that that it's kind of hollow, that he talked about uh, a brittle crust or something like that, RT Green. So once that crust is kind of broken, which at the moment is being sanded down all across this front line to, to be weaker and weaker and weaker, rather than punching through in one place, like they tried that at the beginning, and that didn't work because of the thickness of the artillery support. So now it's sanding down that crust. And then eventually it will be so weak that there will be there will be multiple areas where the Ukrainians can, can burst through. That's the theory anyway. Um, Russian propaganda. And this is another indication that possibly things aren't going particularly well for the Russians. Russian propagandists are silent so as not to sow panic among the soldiers. Over the past week, Ukrainian troops have carried out a number of successful strikes on ammunition storage bases in Crimea, as well as on railway infrastructure in the, in the Chonghar Bridge, for example. And actually, the uh, propagandists have been really quite quiet. Why is that? Because it's an, if they start talking about this, it's an admission that things aren't going well, which tells the, the public the internal Russian audience that things aren't going well. And it tells their own soldiers that things aren't going well. So they're keeping quiet, arguably, this is the kind of claim, they're keeping quiet or quieter so as not to sow that panic and not to admit that things are not going according to plan. That's a positive outlook for the Ukrainians, of course. Um, one must take all of these claims with a pinch of salt, as I always advise. Uh, anyway, that's the end of part one, the first part. There's, uh, as you can see, quite a lot going on. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. I'm away on holiday later, so I'm going to try and get the second part to this done straight away and then my um, frontline uh, map update done straight after that. So it's going to be one after the other and then jogging on. Uh, but um, yeah, hopefully that's okay for you guys. Take care. Speak soon.